for uh, inviting me and, um, uh, and and just to clarify I'm, I'm the outgoing chair of the uh, inflammation uh, committee of the ACTG uh, but um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, immune activation and treated HIV infection and uh, whether it uh, really still matters um, uh, uh, because uh, there have been a lot of um, uh, uh, data in the last few years that have sort of questioned the uh, uh, continued relevance of this topic uh, in the modern treatment era when people are starting therapy at much earlier disease stages. And uh, this is one of the studies that sort of you know, uh, motivated a lot of that skepticism. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, comes from the Kaiser uh, a cohort here in the United States, um, uh, and it's documented very well the improving life expectancy of your average uh, HIV-infected individual um, in the modern treatment uh, era, and uh, 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 the life expectancy uh, for your average 20-year-old um, uh, depicted in red here is continuing to ma march up in the modern treatment era, uh, now up to 53 years old. If you add that to 20, that's uh, 73, so your average 20-year-old uh, living with HIV can expect to live into their 70s, which is a remarkable achievement considering where uh, we were um, uh, not too long ago. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but there still does appear to be a gap uh, compared to the um, age and gender matched uh, life ex expectancy in the general population, a gap of about 12 years or so. Um, now, that gap really narrows uh, quite a bit uh, to only about six years. Some Uh, if you you restrict restrict uh, the analysis the people Started today, or T at a very high hey need your cd4 count above 500 um and don't smoke don't drink uh, and don't have viral hepatitis so so the you know, the you know, the purest uh, you know population uh, you, you can find, uh, and and so that's that's led many people to uh, you know wonder whether a, a lot of um, uh, the uh, multimorbidity that we uh, often think about with um, in treated HIV infection uh, might really start to dwindle away if we uh, start treating people uh, earlier in the course of disease. Um, but um, 
We need to keep in mind that um, a life expectancy is uh, much further reduced uh, in individuals uh, who start ART at a lower Nader CD4 count. Uh, and these are data published a few years ago from the NA Accord, uh, uh, Seattle being one of the you know, major sites contributing to that um, uh, database. Uh, and they've also uh, plotted uh, the <coughs> uh, chronicle, the increasing life expectancy of your average 20-year-old living with HIV. But here they've stratified by the CD, CD4 count at uh, ART initiation. And so for people who started a CD4 count above 350, uh, you have an extraordinarily high uh, life expectancy, uh, 69 years uh, old uh, here, or 69 uh, years in addition to 20, which is actually better than the general population, I think, um, uh, for, for reasons that we can talk about uh, uh, later. But, um, but the striking thing here is that for people who started at a low Nader CD4 count, uh, there's about a 20-year gap in life expectancy. That's a major, major difference. Um, uh, and um, uh, so two decades of life uh, lost by starting uh, uh, ART uh, later. And it is an observational study, and there's lots of potential confounders. People who start ART late may be more likely to use drugs, may have you know, other, other issues which may um, contribute to their life expectancy. Uh, rather than just the virus itself, but it's a it's a striking result that uh, appears in just about every uh, epidemiologic analysis that you do, um, and that's important to note because <clears throat> of the 20 million people or so who are currently uh, on ART around the world, uh, the vast majority of them have started at a CD4 count below 350. Uh, so this is an issue that we're going to be, like it or not, we're going to be dealing with for a very long uh, time uh, to come. Uh, and still, as the world struggles to keep up with um, updated WHO guidelines treating people early, we're still uh, seeing uh, late presentation. Uh, even here in Seattle, I'm sure you see you know, patients who continue to present uh, late to care, um, and uh, they, uh, particularly in safety net populations, end up being a large proportion of the patients that we see. And it's not just this uh, uh, reduced uh, life expectancy. Uh, many age-associated morbidities uh, uh, um, uh, are also increased in treated HIV infection, cardiovascular disease, non-AIDS uh, uh, cancers, uh, osteoporosis uh, fractures, uh, COPD. Uh, I saw Christina Crothers walk in the room. She studies that here. Uh, liver disease, kidney disease, cognitive decline, non-AIDS uh, infections. Um, uh, a new one to the list um, I give this talk often. You may have seen slides like this before, but uh, intermediate stage macular degeneration, the work we've done recently with the SOCA uh, cohort, we've seen that uh, increased uh, nearly four, fourfold um, in, uh, in treated uh, HIV infection, people with a history of AIDS. Um, and, uh, and frailty, the syndrome of multimorbidity um, uh, and functional decline uh, that we associate with um, uh, uh, the, uh, with aging, we see at uh, much younger ages, particularly in people uh, who started at ART very late in the course of the disease. Um, and so, uh, and it's not just a one or two of these things, it's often multimorbidity that we see in our patients in the clinic. I think about uh, my own clinic, uh, it's uh, so little of the amount of time I spend in clinic now is devoted to the antiretrovirals, you know. You know, we used to take out our you know, little you know, uh, <clears throat> cards with drug resistance mutations, try to figure out the best regimen for this patient failing, you know, multi-class, uh, um, uh, 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 having multi-drug resistance, and, and, um, uh, and think through that calculus. Now, ART is pretty simple, and the complicated stuff is everything else that's going on with the patient. It's a multi-morbidity, mental illness in particular, uh, um, cardiovascular uh, risk factors, renal disease, osteoporosis, all this other stuff takes up most of the time. Uh, and, and this is uh, depicted in this slide here uh, from the age HIV uh, uh, cohort uh, in the Netherlands. Um, um, uh, they took a, a, a treated, uh, largely suppressed uh, HIV-infected population and matched them to a really well behaviorally, behaviorally well-matched control group of HIV-uninfected individuals stratified by age. Um, and the number of, multi, uh, uh, of morbid events listed here um, uh, is much greater um, uh, in the HIV-infected group uh, compared to the HIV-uninfected group at any given age. And so um, this is just sort of reflecting what we're seeing in the, in, in the clinic, uh, and uh, I'm sure you're seeing similar things uh, here 
uh, in, in Seattle and in Washington uh, um, at large. And so this leads to a simple question as to whether HIV simply accelerates aging. Um, and, and this was sort of a catchphrase uh, for, uh, for several years. And uh, I don't think that's exactly correct. Um, uh, one of the reasons I don't think this is exactly correct uh, is, is the case of cancer. Um, and it's not all uh, cancers that, uh, uh, that we associate with aging that are increased in the HIV-infected population. It's just some of them. Um, uh, and uh, HIV primarily increases the risk of infection uh, and smoking-related cancers. And so uh, on the left, these are data um, uh, from the Danish cohort. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a population-based study, which is really, really nice. They have electro this electronic medical record that covers the entire country, so they know exactly what happens to everybody. Um, and so you, they don't have to estimate with uh, epidemiology. Um, uh, they can just measure it in everybody. Uh, and so uh, uh, they know uh, that um, there's a significantly higher uh, incidence of infection-related cancers in the HIV-infected population uh, than uh, the general population in blue here um, uh, at any given age. Um, and uh, it's also the case that smoking-related cancers are also increased at most uh, uh, age uh, categories. And the purple line here is just the you know, the relative risk uh, um, <clears throat> across the different age spectrums. And you'll, you'll notice that the, um, uh, here it's an increased risk at uh, all age groups uh, here, most age groups for smoking, uh, but not accelerated aging, right? So it's not that the, the risk of HIV to the general population is increasing as people get older, as you might expect if um, HIV were driving accelerating uh, uh, the aging process. Uh, uh, rather, it's the opposite. Um, you know, as uh, people get older in the general population and their, their risk of these diseases goes up, um, it's going up at almost a similar, if not less, rate uh, in HIV. So it's an increased risk of, uh, of cancer. It's not accelerated uh, uh, aging. Uh, and the other key point, as I alluded to, is that other age-related cancers are not increased. Uh, and some of the big ones that we think about with aging, prostate cancer in men, breast cancer in women, colon cancer, um, some of the big age-related cancers are not increased in HIV at all. And some of them may even be, in some studies, decreased uh, um, a risk for a variety of interesting reasons. Some of it's surveillance bias, but, um, uh, but there may be real biologic reasons behind why uh, some of these cancers uh, are not uh, increased in HIV. <clears throat> so, um, so many morbidities are declining in the modern ART era, though, uh, though some persist. Uh, so you know, this is not accelerated aging uh, uh, that we're seeing. And it's also true that in the modern treatment era, when, when people are getting treated at earlier stages, it's only some diseases that seem to be persisting. Others um, uh, uh, seem to be going away. If you focus on the, you know, that most pristine group, as I mentioned earlier, the people who started a high CD4 count and don't have other comorbidities, you know, you look at, um, we're seeing more and more of those individuals uh, in, in more recent years. And um, uh, this is also from the Danish cohort study. And they looked at um, the relative risk of myocardial infarction in HIV. And that, that appears to be declining uh, in recent years, approaching uh, the rates we see in the general population. Uh, similar inferences have been seen in the Kaiser cohort, for example, Part of this, we think maybe that we're treating people with HIV better for their cardiovascular risk factors. We see people probably more frequently than you know the, uh, the general population sees their general practitioners, and so more opportunities to intervene. Um, uh, but a lot of this may also reflect the fact that we're uh, seeing people now uh, that have started ART at earlier disease stages as well. We also see neurocognitive dysfunction has gone way down. Um, uh, in the modern uh, uh, treatment era, uh, this is um, this is an area of some controversy. Uh, um, you know, cohorts run by neurologists uh, seem to have higher rates of neurocognitive dysfunction. Uh, so, uh, uh, so to take this with a grain of salt, uh, the, the the tools you'll use to measure this severe neurocognitive dysfunction are different and less sensitive, uh, but still gives you the picture that you know there, there's less uh, uh, of the neurocognitive dysfunction than we used to see. Um, and then, but, but look at these others, uh, virus-associated cancers. Uh, um, those virus-associated cancers, uh, uh, while they've been declining, uh, are still quite significantly higher, uh, over you know, two to three-fold higher 
um, uh, than the general population, uh, even in modern uh, times here. And this is you know, highly significant. Um, and uh, chronic liver disease also stubbornly uh, high uh, in the HIV-infected population. So there are some diseases that are, seem to be persisting in the modern treatment era. And another one of those diseases, I mentioned infection-related cancers, but infections themselves, not necessarily AIDS-associated infections, uh, but run-of-the-mill uh, community-acquired pneumonia um, remains very high uh, despite <laughs> ART. And uh, these are also uh, data uh, from the Danish cohort um, uh, uh, showing, uh, and it's a bit dated. I mean, this was published back in 2008. But you look at the, you know, <clears throat> the decline in incidence in community-acquired pneumonia, and it's sort of leveled out pretty flat uh, for, for quite a long time uh, at a level that's uh, over six-fold higher uh, than the general population. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, and uh, even when you restrict to people who have a CD4 count above 500, you still see about a six-fold increased risk of pneumonia. And that's quite striking. Uh, and um, uh, so... Uh, uh, the, that gap in life expectancy may be narrowing, uh, but the quality of life, uh, you think about all the you know, morbidities, um, uh, it may be a, a somewhat different story, particularly the infection-related and cancer-related um, uh, morbidities. And to uh, drive home the point on infections a little bit further, I'm, I'm continually struck uh, uh, by uh, uh, these data from the Temprano uh, study, uh, which is... Um, uh, a trial of uh, both INH and uh, immediate ART uh, in uh, West Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, published a few years ago. And the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine as the START study, um, they demonstrated that starting ART immediately, uh, even in patients with a CD4 count above 500, uh, you have a dramatically reduced risk of, uh, of tuberculosis uh, and, uh, and morbid events, uh, almost all of which was TB in that study. Um, and, um, and that's what, that's the headline, uh, from that study. Uh, but, uh, uh on the second page, uh, you find, gosh, there really was, even in the people who started ART immediately and even got, uh, isoniazid preventative therapy for six months, you know, out of 30 months, they still have an extraordinarily high, uh, uh, risk of, uh, uh, mostly TB, five to seven percent, um, and, uh, in just 30 months, um, and that's extraordinarily high uh, compared to the general population, probably on the order of eight-fold higher um, uh, per uh, my TB uh, colleagues. Um, and um, it's also important to note that there is a mortality benefit of isoniazid uh, noted in this trial. So even in people starting therapy uh, relatively early in the course of their disease, you actually decrease mortality with just a, a single pill of INH to prevent uh, tuberculosis that speaks to how significant um, uh, the infection complications uh, uh, are in resource-limited uh, settings uh, like this. And so, as I mentioned, the, you know, the, um, uh, I, I, I look at morbidity and mortality uh, from a global perspective, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a really big uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, for our field moving forward, the persistent uh, infectious and uh, neoplastic complications that we see, even in people who start early. So, <clears throat> so we've seen that uh, there is clearly improving um, morbidity and mortality with earlier ART and better regimens, um, uh, uh, but there really is this stubbornly high morbidity and mortality in individuals who start ART with low CD4 nadirs, and, and this really is still the majority of people living with HIV globally. Um, some morbidities remain high despite early ART, and these are really the infectious complications and infection-associated cancers, uh, and particularly a problem in low-income countries. So what's driving all of this? Um, well, uh, many of us um, uh, have focused on the role of persistent inflammation uh, in contributing to these morbid events, um, uh, as um, often the signal persists, uh, even when adjusted for lifestyle factors, uh, and potential ART toxicities. And why would we focus on this? Well, uh, we get an important clue from nature, uh, the natural host of the simian immunodeficiency virus, where one of the strains of HIV uh, came from, um, uh, the Sudi Mangabe, found in Western Africa, 
uh, when infected with SIV naturally, uh, uh, experiences very high levels of virus replication, comparable to, if not higher than we see in HIV-infected people, yet the monkey lives a normal lifespan and does not get AIDS, no immunodeficiency. You take the same virus and you put it in a different monkey, the rhesus macaque on the right, uh, has comparable levels of virus replication, uh, but the monkey rapidly progresses uh, to AIDS and death um, and profound immunodeficiency. The animal model, uh, most commonly used animal model uh, of AIDS. And so the difference between the two monkeys is not the virus. The virus is exactly the same, but rather it's the response of the immune system to the virus uh, that determines how rapidly the monkeys progress. The monkey on the left that uh, does not get sick um, uh, has very little uh, uh, generalized immune activation in the chronic phase of the infection, uh, uh, whereas the monkey on the right has massive levels of chronic immune activation in the chronic phase, um, and, and the more of it uh, that they have, the more rapidly they progress. Uh, and it's not just the T cells and the B cells that are supposed to respond to SIV antigens that are getting activated. It's a global uh, non-antigen specific uh, activation, and it's the innate immune system that gets activated too. Um, and the more of that you have, the more rapidly you progress. The same thing is true in HIV-infected people and untreated disease. Um, and we showed you know, many years ago now that um, uh, one of the markers of uh, this uh, chronic immune activation process, uh, frequency of activated CDA T cells, um, clearly seems to decline uh, during viral suppression uh, in green relative to the untreated state in red, uh, but it remains persistently abnormal uh, compared to HIV uninfected individuals in blue, um, despite years of viral suppression. And so um, immune activation seems to persist. Um, uh, what's more, uh, innate uh, immune activation and inflammation also uh, seems to persist, and uh, many groups have uh, published on this as well. Uh, and these are data linking this inflammatory state uh, to subsequent morbidity and mortality. Reference briefly the, uh, um, the, the Insight Network's uh, uh, START trial. This is the SMART trial done uh, a decade earlier, um, uh, as well as the Esprit and Silcat uh, IL-2 studies. Uh, they took the control groups uh, from these arms, just uh, individuals who uh, were on stable, suppressive antiretroviral therapy and followed forward in time and they measured a single measurement of IL-6 and D-dimer at baseline and asked, does that predict what happens to people subsequently? Uh, are they more likely to get uh, non-AIDS events uh, like heart disease, cancer, um, uh, osteoporotic fractures, and the like? And what they found uh, was that, yes, uh, those in the highest quartile of these biomarkers um, in red uh, had a strikingly higher uh, risk of disease. Um, you can see the hazard ratio down here. Um, but, but just uh, comparing the absolute numbers, uh, about a 20% incidence uh, of a serious non-AIDS event or death uh, compared to about 5% in the lowest two quartiles. So this is a pretty striking difference that uh, 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 plays out over a whole decade. And the other thing to take away from this slide is that these curves are continuing to separate over time. Uh, so it's suggesting that to us that uh, there's likely to be an inflammatory set point within individuals. Some individuals who likely are at low risk and will continue to be at low risk over time. And other people who are continually at high risk uh, that will continue uh, to accumulate uh, morbidity. Uh, and we think that the inflammatory state is likely to be uh, uh, important uh, in, in this process. Um, the other striking uh, observation from the Insight Network is uh, when they apply the same uh, uh, method, the same um, uh, test of the same biomarkers, this time in the START trial of people who started ART uh, either immediately or delayed at a CD4 count above 500. Um, and uh, they, they found a very similar association. In fact, the hazard ratio uh, for IL-6 and D-dimer um, uh, was almost identical um, uh, in individuals who started early uh, uh, versus late. Um, of course, there are far fewer uh, clinical events that happen when people start early uh, but the relationship between immune activation and uh, morbidity, mortality, is almost exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so subsequently, there have been uh, a whole host of um, uh, studies, uh, some of which uh, our group has been involved in, 
uh, linking uh, uh, inflammation to uh, subsequent morbidity and mortality in, in, in the modern treatment era. Um, and I've listed all the, um, uh, or many of the uh, morbidities that it's been associated with, including mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer, venous thromboembolism, type 2 diabetes, COPD, renal disease, bacterial pneumonia, cognitive dysfunction, depression, uh, so even mental illness, um, uh, and uh, frailty. Um, uh, all have been uh, linked to the inflammatory state. Uh, all this is observational data, of course, as we can't prove uh, that inflammation is causing these events um, in these studies. Uh, uh, but there, uh, the weight of evidence certainly suggestive uh, that uh, there's uh, likely to be a link between uh, the inflammatory state and multimorbidity in this setting. And so then uh, to test this, we need to ask, why is this happening in the first place? Where do we intervene? Um, um, and um, uh, right now in the clinic, I can tell you what I do uh, 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 while we wait for uh, new research to come along uh, for uh, novel uh, therapeutic interventions. Um, and, and most of what I talk about in clinic are lifestyle inter uh, inter interventions, and they're important. Um, they're empowering for patients, uh, and they also seem to uh, be beneficial in reducing the inflammatory state. Um, but they also clearly reduce uh, the risk of multimorbidity. If you have an individual who's at high risk for cardiovascular disease uh, because of inflammation, well, you know, maybe you should also address the non-AIDS um, uh, or, or the um, uh, non-infection related risk factors for cardiovascular disease even more vigorously. And this point was uh, made by Carrie Altoff at Croy earlier this year, um, where uh, she assessed uh, 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 the, uh, the, the relative proportion of um, variability in uh, MI risk that was explained by traditional risk factors versus uh, HIV-related risk factors. And ever smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, you know, the big three here, uh, explain a much greater proportion of the risk of cardiovascular disease than do things like CD4 count and uh, uh, viral load uh, in, the, in the context of HIV. So, you know, those traditional risk factors are really important uh, to, uh, to focus on. Uh, and we also heard um, uh, at Croy earlier this year from the DAD study uh, that quitting smoking really has a favorable impact, at not you know, unexpected, uh, on, uh, on cancer. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is for all cancer. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the, while, while the lung cancer uh, uh, specifically was not significant in this particular study, still relatively underpowered, if you look at all um, uh, uh, cancers, there's a clear decline um, as people have quit smoking for longer periods of time, uh, the risk of cancer really goes down um, and approaches that of um, never smokers, which is great news for our patients and really encouraging them that, that this is something that they can do to really uh, reduce their risk of disease moving forward. Um, and then exercise. Um, moderate exercise really appears to decrease inflammation. It has all sorts of other health benefits that you're, uh, most of us are aware of. Um, I know I don't exercise as much as I, uh, I should, uh, but showing this slide always reminds me that I should be doing a better job of that, um, particularly when I encourage my patients to do it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, C-reactive protein, D-dimer, IL-6, um, uh, all uh, decline with just uh, three times a week of brisk walking for 60 minutes. Uh, so pretty, you know, you know, just moderate intensity exercise can have a big uh, impact uh, on the inflammatory state. So uh, one question, though, that comes up is whether all inflammation is the same. If we, when, we, when we're trying to think about where to intervene, uh, are all root drivers of the inflammatory state uh, equally responsible for the disease that we see in treated HIV infection? Or do some drivers of inflammation have a greater impact on morbidity and mortality than others? And so here I'd like to share with, the, uh, share with you some uh, data from the uh, Copenhagen uh, uh, cohort. Uh, it's a very like Danish-focused talk. I'm realizing now. Uh, uh, seem to be quoting the Danes uh, uh, often here, but uh, but this is a really um, uh, uh, interesting study. They met, they measured um, this biomarker soluble CD163 that predicts mortality uh, in a large number of patients um, uh, uh, in their in their clinic in in, in Copenhagen, and uh, and they showed that it predicted you know, mortality among other things, um, but. Because it was so large, they were able to break it up into different subgroups. Um, and um, the point of this slide is not to uh, suggest that injection drug use is uh, 
not bad for you. It's clearly bad for you in a whole myriad of different ways. Um, and it's, but it's also associated with the inflammatory state. So it's one of the things that will increase um, uh, immune activation. Uh, if you're uh, injecting drugs through the skin, you introduce bacteria. Um, there's a whole host and, and other you know, uh, 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 toxins. Uh, 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 you know, so it's a direct driver of immune activation. And you might ask whether that immune activation uh, predicts mortality just the same as HIV-driven uh, immune activation. Uh, and interestingly, it doesn't seem to. Um, so among non-injection drug users, uh, the uh, relationship between immune activation uh, and, uh, mor and mortality is stronger uh, uh, than the relationship between uh, inflammation and mortality among injection drug users. So clearly injection drug users are more likely to, to die. I'm not saying that their um, that IDU is not a risk. But what I'm saying is that the relationship uh, between immune activation and mortality is weaker in, in um, injection drug users, just in that it's those other things that are driving mortality. Um, uh, and um, so I think that the, um, the, the root driver of the inflammatory state is important uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, how it's uh, uh, contributing to disease. And the same thing is true in smokers. Uh, the relationship between immune activation and mortality is stronger in never smokers than it is uh, in smokers. Um, and so just to make the point that the, the, the driver of the inflammatory state may make a difference. <clears throat> um, so uh, where might we uh, focus our uh, uh, initial therapeutic strategies? Uh, so I like to talk about the low-lying fruit. Uh, so uh, testing commonly used drugs with anti-inflammatory properties um, uh, and uh, if we can show that uh, these drugs like, say, statins or aspirin um, improve biomarkers in pilot trials, uh, we might be able to advance them to clinical endpoint studies uh, uh, and have a, uh, a, because we were familiar with the safety profile, have a rapidly um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, generalizable and um, uh, uh, intervention that could be used. Uh, and. Uh, indeed, uh, this was done with statins. Uh, uh, this is uh, data from Grace McComsey and Nick Funderburg's um, uh, uh, Saturn uh, study of resuvastatin. Uh, they showed uh, that um, uh, out of 24 and 48 weeks of therapy, uh, those getting the statin had a significant reduction in soluble CD14, this marker of monocyte macrophage uh, activation. Uh, and um, uh, others, uh, 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 Janet Lowe and Steve Grinspoon, showed that um, uh, statins, uh, in this case it's torvastatin, actually led to plaque regression as measured by uh, CT uh, scanning. And so uh, there's, a, uh, not surprisingly, a cardiovascular uh, benefit of statins uh, and, um, and this apparent uh, 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 benefit on uh, a marker of immune activation. Uh, but, you know, other uh, uh, low-lying fruit interventions uh, have failed to, to demonstrate benefit. So we've done a number of these studies in the past few years. We did a very well done, well controlled uh, study of aspirin, two different doses versus placebo, um, zero effect on any uh, 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 marker of immune activation of interest uh, in HIV. ACE inhibitors have not been uh, uh, um, you know, successful thus far uh, in at least placebo controlled trials. And the same thing with um, uh, 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 ARBs. Um, and so a lot of the low-lying fruit interventions that have, we thought had an inflammatory interventions haven't necessarily panned out, but the statins have. And that's, and that's led to um, uh, the Reprieve trial, uh, which is um, uh, a, you know, a multi-center international uh, trial of, uh, of 6,500 individuals with treated HIV infection, randomized uh, to pitavastatin versus placebo. Um, to see whether it decreases cardiovascular events, you know, so heart attack, um, uh, stroke, et cetera. Um, and um, uh, so this is uh, now over 75% enrolled, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it'll be now uh, several years uh, before we get a result uh, from this trial. Uh, but I think this is the first example in the HIV space where we've taken uh, uh, an anti-inflammatory intervention all the way from basic you know, uh, pilot studies on biomar with biomarker outcomes uh, to a clinical endpoint trial to actually demonstrate a clinical benefit. And I think um, this study will be 
really important, uh, not just for its primary outcome, which is cardiovascular events. I think most people wouldn't be that surprised if another study of statins showed that they were helpful for cardiovascular disease, but, um, but it would be really interesting if statins reduced cancer, reduced osteoporotic fractures, and some of those other uh, in inflammation-associated diseases, um, uh, if we had evidence that a, uh, an, an anti-inflammatory intervention prevented those, that would be strong evidence, I think, that um, the inflammatory state is now perhaps causally associated with disease, not just, um, uh, uh, not just uh, in an observational way. Uh, and, um, and what's more, uh, we might be able to start to better define true surrogate markers of disease um, uh, the, you know, the biomarkers uh, whose reduction with an intervention actually corresponds to a reduction in risk, and that'll be really important for the HIV field, too. What if statins are not enough? And I don't think they're going to be enough. Uh, uh, I, I've had a number of patients who, who have lost uh, uh, um, uh, to you know, sudden cardiac death and, and, other, uh, and other complications who are already on a statin. Uh, um, and... Uh, and I, I, I suspect that there's likely to be, uh, particularly in those individuals at the highest inflammatory state over time, uh, you know, continued room uh, for improvement um, to mitigate risk. And I think we need to address the root causes of the inflammation uh, to develop uh, improved interventions. <clears throat> One of the places to look is the virus itself. Um, virus continues to leach out of cells, um, uh, uh, even during suppressive antiretroviral therapy. Our drugs. Um, block new rounds of replication, and thus most of the virus that we measure, we think reflects a, a release of virus from cells in the absence of productive replication. There's this ongoing debate uh, that will continue for forever about whether there's you know, still some low-level um, uh, replication happening in tissues. Um, uh, but uh, I can see that most of the virus we measure is still just coming out of cells. And, and that's important to recognize because um, we lack interventions that block HIV expression. If you think about it, all the interventions we have block new rounds of HIV replication, but they don't block HIV from coming out of cells in the first place. Um, and that alone may be enough to activate the immune system. Uh, and uh, it sure would be good if we had interventions that uh, could turn off the tap, uh, um, if you will. We think that uh, uh, blocking some uh, herpes viruses like CMV uh, may, may also uh, can, uh, um, be a strategy to reduce immune activation. Uh, we published this trial several years ago of uh, valgancyclovir to reduce a low level CMV replication and said we could reduce immune activation after eight weeks, an effect that was sustained for four weeks after uh, we stopped the intervention. Um, of note, val acyclovir, which has a potent activity against the herpes simplex virus, uh, but a very minimal uh, anti-CMV activity at the dosages used, uh, failed to decrease immune activation in a subsequent trial. Uh, so we think the effect we saw is probably uh, uh, more uh, likely to be an effect on CMV um, uh, than, than HSV. Um, but um, uh, uh, but valgancyclovir has, uh, has a lot of toxicities. Um, uh, and uh, well, you know, we're not sure where this reduction in immune activation really is. Um, uh, that uh, uh, would translate into a, a clinical benefit yet. Uh, and we need safer CMV drugs, um, uh, I think, to test that hypothesis. Um, uh, another uh, a potential driver is microbial translocation, the so-called leaky gut syndrome. Um, and um, uh, many of you are familiar with this hypothesis. Um, uh, uh, on the top is uh, a cartoon of a normal gut epithelium and someone without HIV. This pink ribbon is the epithelial barrier. These blue risotto-like particles are the bacteria in the lumen of the gut that are prevented from getting into the systemic circulation. And behind that brick wall, you have a, an intact uh, gut-associated uh, immune system that's just uh, geared up, ready to clear invading uh, um, uh, uh, organisms. Uh, but in in, in the very first few weeks of HIV, really the first few days um, uh, of the infection from the animal models, we know there's profound uh, loss of mucosal immunity. Uh, there's um, uh, both a um, uh, 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 loss of uh, CD4 T cells, in particular uh, T cell subsets that have uh, important protective effects uh, for the gut epithelium like TH17, TH22 cells. Uh, and there's also direct disruption of the gut epithelial barrier, you know, loss of tight junctions between epithelial cells, epithelial cell apoptosis, 
Um, and uh, this allows gut bacteria to get in and driving immune activation. And so um, immune act uh, microbial translocation has uh, been highlighted as a potential driver of the inflammatory state as well. And, and then so you could say, okay, we could try um, uh, directing interventions at these underlying root causes. And many of us have uh, been trying to work uh, in that space for some time uh, and haven't had great success uh, other than you know, treating CMV uh, and, and, and blocking some of those root drivers. You could also go after one of the many uh, immune activation pathways that are uh, predictive of disease. And we've, uh, we've done studies uh, linking uh, uh, various immune activation pathways to disease, many of which are strongly associated with mortality during treated HIV infection. These are hazard ratios, um, uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, odds ratios um, uh, from a nested case control study in the SOCA cohort, extraordinarily high, 70-fold increased risk of, um, of death for individuals in the top quartile of IL-6, for example. Uh, so should we you know, block IL-6 directly? You know, so these questions come up. So how do we choose a specific interventional target? Um, uh, should we just pick one of those, uh, pick the one that's the highest? Um, so I like to think of uh, immune activation as sort of like a tree. Um, and so all the leaves on the tree uh, are the various end organ diseases that are increased, uh, we think, by the, uh, uh, the inflammatory state. Um, uh, and the roots are all the various um, uh, drivers of the inflammatory state that have been described. And there are perhaps a you know, several more that uh, may be uh, contributing, but HIV reservoir, CMV, microbial translocation. Um, uh, but uh, how, if, we wanna, if we wanted to cut down the tree, uh, how would we go about doing this? Would we go after um, uh, the roots? Would we go after the branches, the various different pathways that seem to uh, uh, predict disease, adaptive immune defects, IL-6 elevations, coagulation abnormalities, D-dimer, lymphoid fibrosis, should we block one of those individual branches? Um, and so if we go after individual roots and branches, I call this the whack-a-mole problem. So um, if you go after just one branch and are not blocking all the underlying causes, uh, you know, the mole may just pop up over here. And there are several examples of this um, uh, phenomenon in, um, in our field. Um, one of my colleagues, Jeff Jacobson, uh, did a study of... Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of TLR inhibition, toll-like receptor inhibition with chloroquine as an anti-malarial drug. It has some, uh, um, uh, 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 some anti-inflammatory effects by blocking the sensor of the innate immune system. Uh, and he studied it in untreated disease and in treated disease. And, and in untreated HIV infection, when he blocked a uh, uh, toll-like uh, uh, receptor uh, uh, activity with chloroquine, he saw an increase in viral load. This is like the mole popping up over here. So you, if you're not addressing the underlying cause and you block just one uh, aspect of the immune response, you may have uh, untoward, uh, unforeseen consequences. Uh, you may be reducing uh, the uh, protective uh, antiviral effects of the immune system uh, and uh, allowing HIV to actually be more of a problem, or perhaps some of the other um, uh, uh, root drivers, like, say, CMV, for example. Um, and so, uh, as we think about where to intervene, it, it, it strikes me that we, we'd love to find the, the, the tree trunk. You know, if we want to cut down the tree, we go after the trunk of the tree. Um, uh, are there common inflammatory pathways that um, are induced by multiple root drivers, uh, but also give rise to all the downstream uh, uh, pathways of interest? Um, and there are several, um, you know, candidate interventions, uh, some of which are... are uh, currently uh, in clinical trials uh, right now, uh, like ruxolitinib, canakinumab, uh, that are uh, uh, attacking some of these very early innate pathways. Um, uh, and uh, as we do these uh, studies, it's important uh, that we look at their effects uh, on uh, some of these root drivers. Uh, if we're blocking the innate immune system, are we having an untoward effect on CMV shedding, for example, by, by removing some of the protective antiviral responses? Um, and um, uh, we, uh, we've gotten a lot of enthusiasm for this approach recently from uh, a recent uh, uh, Cantos trial published in the New England Journal um, uh, this, this summer, uh, the IL-1 beta inhibitor canakinumab. Uh, this is a, a very early pathway in flamasome activation, uh, a very early event in innate immune activation that is 
abnormally activated uh, in the context of HIV infection as well. And this intervention was studied uh, in individual HIV uninfected individuals um, with cardiovascular disease to see whether blocking intervent uh, blocking inflammation directly. You know, none of this. You know, does statins have an anti-inflammatory benefit versus uh, a cholesterol uh, effect mediating their 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 benefit? This is a pure anti-inflammatory intervention given to people with heart disease. And what they showed is that, yes, it reduced inflammation, CRP here, but it also significantly reduced cardiovascular events. Um, and this is the first clear example that blocking inflammation reduced cardiovascular disease. Uh, they also found uh, that it reduced uh, uh, mortality from lung cancer uh, in that study as well. Uh, uh, so. Uh, further evidence that in inflammation is contributing to uh, uh, um, uh, malignancy uh, uh, risk as well. Um, and um, so this, this, tr this intervention has actually been studied by Priscilla Shu at San Francisco General uh, in a pilot trial uh, in um, uh, uh, treated HIV infection. She's shown that it uh, clearly reduces um, uh, uh, inflammation by uh, CRP uh, and IL-6 as well. Uh, in just uh, uh, 10, 10 patients, uh, comparable reductions to what we've seen in the, uh, in the Cantos uh, uh, study. Um, and uh, if you were to translate this into what this might mean in HIV based on the uh, observational data that we have, the 30% reduced uh, uh, levels of IL-6 that she saw uh, might translate into a 25% uh, decreased odds of a non-AIDS event. Um, uh, in, uh, in HIVs. That's a pretty substantial relative um, risk reduction uh, um, uh, uh, that, that, that we might see with this intervention if, um, if the observational data are, are to be believed. Um, and so is canakinumab or blocking IL-1 beta a viable intervention in treated HIV? Well, uh, there, uh, there are concerns uh, uh, that um, uh, blocking canakinumab uh, might have untoward uh, effects on infectious complications. There was a significantly increased risk of fatal infections and in sepsis in the Cantos trial in that study of, in cardiovascular disease. Now, because these were individuals with heart disease, and they were, if they're going to die of something, it's most likely they're going to die of heart disease, uh, the benefit on cardiovascular disease and lung cancer far outweighed uh, the potential risk of uh, a sepsis and fatal infections that was observed. But the balance might be different uh, in, in the context of HIV disease. I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, and uh, there, there may be some concern about negative consequences on immune function. Um, and uh, we also need to consider uh, that, uh, at least in the pilot study done by Priscilla Shu, there did not appear to be a discernible um, uh, impact on uh, on T cell activation and, um, and and adaptive immune defects. And so, uh, is this truly a tree trunk or is this a branch? Um, uh, and uh, uh, are there other aspects of the immune response that need to be um, uh, addressed? And so, our tree might not be uh, a tree with a single trunk. Uh, our tree, you know, might be a banyan tree uh, with multiple uh, trunks. Um, uh, and it could be that. You know, some patients uh, have uh, a problem. Uh, uh, their problem is mostly here. Other other patients, their problem is mostly here, and it, and, and we may end up in a situation where there may be some you know, sort of you know, uh, personalized medicine approach to the management of immune activation at some point in the future um, uh, in HIV. Uh, uh, but um, it's likely not quite as complicated as the banyan tree. Hopefully, I'm hoping it's not. Uh, um, uh, but um, but I do think that it's it's quite likely that there are certain pathways that are going to be more important in different settings. One one issue is whether you know the most important immunologic pathways uh, depend on the region of the world in your clinical setting. You know we've done uh, uh, some studies um, in U.S. based cohorts um, uh, and uh, are ranking the various biomarkers that predict disease in terms of their uh, ability to predict uh, uh, morbid events and. And this is sort of a, a rough ranking of uh, four of those biomarkers that we get you know, uh, for in U.S.-based cohorts. Um, when we look in um, a cohort in southwestern Uganda, a more rural setting, um, uh, the, uh, the order is uh, reversed in a, in a pretty you know, striking way uh, in our eyes. And, 
and, uh, and similar inferences are seen uh, from uh, uh, others. Uh, Ashwin Blagopal uh, uh, doing a, a study, the, the, the Pearl study uh, in, the, in the ACTG, um, <clears throat> seeing a, a similarly different uh, ordering of biomarkers uh, uh, when uh, you're looking at uh, uh, resource-limited settings. Um, and and one, of the, one of the issues is that in U.S.-based cohorts, uh, still most of the um, uh, drivers of mortality are non-infectious causes. You know, if you get pneumonia or tuberculosis in Seattle or San Francisco, largely you're going to do okay. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's, um, it's the cardiovascular complications and cancer that, that um, uh, patients die from. But, but in resource-limited settings, still infectious causes remain a, an important uh, uh, driver of uh, mortality. And so it may be that the pathways that uh, that confer adaptive immune defects, um, uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk, you know, more specifically about the IDO pathway is, is a top hit here, uh, but uh, that that is a path, an innate pathway that confers adaptive immune defects that may be, um, uh, uh, you know, more important in regions of the world where infectious complications are important. And another thing to leave you with is that the uh, the drivers immune activation uh, uh, that are active um, uh, may depend on the timing of ART initiation. So in individuals with a very high CD4 inhibitor uh, who um, uh, started at a CD4 count above 500, early stages of disease, you know, while they may have um, uh, uh, HIV reservoirs well established in lymphoid tissues, that happens in the first week of the infection. Um, you, know, you, you, you dramatically get this you know, expansion of the reservoir uh, in those early stages. Um, it clearly gets worse uh, um, uh, as people get more advanced disease, but it's well established early. That reservoir is, is um, established uh, in the very anatomic compartment where adaptive immune responses um, uh, develop, right? You're, you develop a B cell or a T cell response in a lymph node, and that's precisely where the HIV reservoir is concentrated. Um, and so it makes sense that the inflammation uh, that it may be inducing may have an, um, an outsized effect on adaptive immune defects. Uh, microbial translocation, uh, the degree to which, while it happens um, at the very earliest stages, uh, even before um, uh, the virus becomes detectable in peripheral blood, in animal models, uh, there are, there's evidence of a gut barrier defect um, uh, that happens um, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, during very early pathogenesis, but the degree to which it's irreversible during therapy uh, is much greater in individuals who start ART much later. Um, microbial translocation, these uh, uh, microbial products go all through the bloodstream and may contribute to multiple morbidities. Um, HIV, it's controversial whether it can uh, uh, in stably infect myeloid cells uh, during a stably treated HIV infection. If it does, then I think there's a reasonable amount of evidence that it can. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it distributes uh, the anatomic distribution of HIV throughout the body. So it's no longer just confined largely to the inductive lymphoid tissues. Uh, now it's in the brain, it's in the liver, it's in the fat, um, all of which may uh, 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 contribute uh, to the ver a much wider spectrum of uh, diseases um, uh, that we think about. And the same thing with CMV, uh, likely not as much of a problem in people who have a really healthy immune system who started ART very early, uh, but there's likely a lot more CMV shedding in people with low CD4 counts. Since CMV replicates in vascular tissue, it's, it stands to reason that it might be contributing to uh, a vascular disease there. So this is just a theoretical model of how we're thinking about how various root drivers might uh, connect. And it may not be um, the same uh, distribution of, uh, uh, of um, root drivers in individuals who start early versus those who start late. <clears throat> so to summarize, um, immune activation strongly predicts increased morbidity and mortality in treated HIV, particularly infectious complications and cancer. Uh, uh, while we wait for new interventions to be developed for this, uh, lifestyle interventions are clearly important in addressing those traditional risk factors for you know, chronic disease. Uh, and it's sensible, I think, to prioritize studies of interventions uh, uh, targeting the root causes. Um, uh, uh, you know, while, you know, while statins are uh, under study of the low-lying fruit, um, uh, we, uh, there are newer agents for CMV that are now um, uh, just developed, uh, but we need... Um, 
uh, we need to study them, but we also need interventions uh, to block HIV expression and microbial translocation. And we hope to find a tree trunk, but it's possible that our tree is a banyan and uh, that we may need uh, to consider you know, uh, targeting different um, uh, 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 parts of the tree uh, uh, in, in, in different situations. Uh, and uh, that could be international uh, differences or it could be uh, based on CD4 and uh, So with that, I'll, I'll stop uh, and acknowledge uh, all my collaborators, uh, folks in our lab, uh, uh, the scope and options uh, teams uh, um, uh, and our collaborators uh, both at UCSF uh, uh, and, uh, and around uh, the world. So with that, I'll stop and take your questions. And uh, just one uh, reminder to people uh, in, the, in the audience here that there are people uh, online, I guess, uh, that can't hear your questions. I'll have to uh, repeat it uh, um, just to prepare you for that. So thanks. Yeah. With the, the CD90, uh, you know, it's always a treatment. And I, I wonder if you have any insights into uh, whether or not there are people that people have had CD90. So people that, I mean, simply this might be long term non aggressors, but are there individuals who have relatively high viral loads but don't seem to be bothered by it? Maybe <coughs> they don't drop their ketone very much. Maybe yeah. they don't have very much inflammation. Yeah. Uh, and could we learn anything from how those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great question, and um, yeah. So there are they're they're very rare. Uh, we call them viremic non-progressors, um, uh, and uh, uh, probably less than 0.1 percent of HIV-infected you know, people will have uh, uh, stable, stably high CD4 counts uh, for at least a decade, despite a high viral load. We say over 10,000 or so. Um, and we've um, identified a number of those individuals in the Bay Area, uh, um, San Francisco Bay Area, and we've done some initial studies uh, in collaboration actually with Nicole Klatt uh, uh, here at, uh, um, at, at UW. Um, uh, and uh, there are some shared elements uh, uh, to the, the Sudi Mangabe uh, natural host uh, story and some that are different. Uh, so the shared part is that uh, they, they have, you know, high viral load, no CD4 depletion. Uh, and the other thing is that their central memory T cells seem to be relatively protected. Um, uh, that's a, 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 a theme that comes from the, uh, the Sudi Mangabe and the African green monkey. The virus seems to be replicating in effector T cells uh, that are more short-lived and maybe more expendable. Um, uh, and it seems to protect the central memory cell. Uh, and we saw a very similar thing in the uh, viremic non-progressors. Um, that did not seem to prevent them from getting immune activation, though. So they still have um, uh, uh, abnormal levels of T cell activation. And we haven't studied all the different you know, uh, immunologic pathways. But uh, my, my guess is that it's not, um, it's not completely identical uh, to the, um, the, the natural host. And, one of one of uh, these individuals is uh, my 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 own personal patient, and uh, and um, I had uh, I had started him on ART because of premature cardiovascular disease. In the absence of risk factors, you know, he had you know you know de you know developed early heart disease. So I um, so I've, I've wondered whether there's um uh, you know it, it's not exactly the same. There's still some immune activity. Yeah. 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 So the question is uh, you know, whether you know, treating hepatitis C also reduces immune activation, and that's a really interesting uh, area because um, uh, it, uh, it it also gets to this uh, whack-a-mole issue too, because there there are there are interestingly some protective effects of uh, hepatitis C. You're probably aware of the of uh, these, these case reports of um, hepatitis B reactivation in people who get treated for their hepatitis C. Um, uh, there's a, hepatitis C may induce this type 1 interferon response that actually has favorable antiviral effects against hepatitis B. 
So when you treat the hepatitis C, you no longer have this uh, induction of a, a protective immune response, and you may get reactivation of another virus. It's still a lot of controversy as to how uh, frequently that happens. It seems to be a rare phenomenon, but it does appear to be you know, a real one. Um, um, and um, uh, what, it is true that some markers of immune activation go down uh, with hepatitis C treatment, uh, but, uh, but it's also possible that some of those may have had you know, a protective effects. Uh, and so it's, um, so it's likely a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think there, there is a lot of hope that, uh, for example, treating hepatitis C might, might have beneficial effects on um, you know, a non-infectious uh, uh, morbidity like cardiovascular disease in life. And it'll take time uh, for, uh, you know, we get further into the treatment era, uh, the, the modern treatment era of hepatitis C to see whether, in fact, there's clear evidence of that. Yeah, so the question relates to whether there are specific diets uh, that are protective um, uh, for immune activation. And um, I, you know, I haven't seen, you know, clear evidence uh, of that on a, um, uh, you know, in, in clinical research studies. What I will say, though, is that there's evidence that uh, eating a high-fat diet, uh, you know, experimentally will induce microbial translocation even in people with, without HIV. Uh, so, 